Okay, I think it's probably time to get started. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Damien van Perveld. I work at the University of Glasgow, where I lead the Scottish Center for War Studies and Conflict Archaeology. And I'll be hosting um, this uh, book launch today. I'm very excited to host a book launch of um, a colleague uh, that works at the University of Glasgow too, Erin Jesse, and to co-host this event uh, with uh, the Perpetrator Studies Network, um, uh, a group of a group of scholars um, that is uh, interdisciplinary and international, and that, as its name says, uh, researchers, perpetrators of genocides. Um, so um, I don't want to uh, last too long. I'll just talk a bit about the organization of this book launch today. Uh, we'll start with a brief introduction by um, one of the co-editors of um, the volumes that is being launched today uh, and entitled um, Researching Perpetrators of Genocides, published at the University of Wisconsin Press in 2020. And so um, Chell Anderson uh, will um, uh, be the first one to talk and, and he'll just introduce the and talk about the origins of the project for a couple of minutes at the start. And then we'll follow a more um, classic type of approach um, uh, with uh, um, six different contributors to the edited volumes who will present their contribution, their chapter to this volume. I've asked to each of them to speak for seven to eight minutes max so that we keep the first part to roughly an hour before we move on to Q&A. Um, I've asked to each of the contributors to talk about three points, what the chapter is all about, what methods they've used, and what are the key findings uh, that they present in the chapter, as well as their significance. Uh, so I don't want to use too much time. Uh, Chell, if you want to um, um, uh, turn your video on, uh, Chell Anderson is um, a professor at the University of Manitoba uh, and the co-editor of this volume. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Damien, and welcome everybody to our Book launch, we're so glad that you can join us today. I'd be remiss as well to mention the, the couple of uh, contributors who weren't able to make this event. Ur Umet Ungur, Marie-Sophie de Vres, and, and Damien Scalia. Although I think Damien might be in the audience as well. Uh, our book grew out of several workshops, first of all in Vancouver, and that was co-organized by Aaron Jesse and Thomas Kahn, then in Yerevan, and then in Jerusalem. But more importantly, I think our book grew out of the recognition that we weren't really talking about the challenges that we faced in doing research on and with perpetrators, or rather these conversations were really confined to coffee breaks at conferences rather than being a subject of considered academic analysis. And so our book in a sense is an, maybe an antidote to that, or at least a beginning to that. And, Perhaps immodestly, it's a, it's a book that I wished I'd had myself when I started doing perpetrator research. And our book is dedicated to Lian Fuji, of course. And one of the things that Lian Fuji taught us about doing research is that research methods are more than just tools. Research methods actually represent an ethos, a way of doing things. And indeed, the process of producing research should, I think, be a power for, an empowering process a reflective process and an educational process for researcher and, and perhaps also for participants in the project at large. So our book and this launch today are really conversation starters. We hope that our interventions are useful and that other scholars will then take up the mantle in dealing with some of these challenges in researching perpetrators. Thank you everyone again. So, Kshel, um, you're the first one uh, on the list of authors who will present their chapters. Just a couple of points here. Uh, one of them is there might be a slight problem with your microphone, um, at least, uh, um, and that could be if somebody could confirm that in the chat, but I'm, I'm, it's going up and down, basically, the volume. So I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, you can do anything about this. Um, now, I'll reintroduce you again, uh, just by saying that you're also the director of the master's program in human rights uh, at the University of Manitoba. Uh, and that's uh, you an assistant professor of law. So uh, that's a, a good way for me to emphasize the kind of uh, interdisciplinary nature of uh, this edited volume project. And of course, you've been working on uh, a perpetrating genocide with um, a book published with Routledge on the topic in 2018. Uh, again, the f I cede back the floor to you uh, to uh, talk about your chapter contribution. Thanks, Damien. This is the, the Zoom era, <laughs> dealing with microphones all the time. But I I think the microphone is closer to me now, so hopefully that solves the problem. 
So my chapter in the book is a bit different than a lot of the other chapters in the sense that it's more conceptual, uh, but I am drawing from my own experience as, as Damien kind of alluded to there. Oh, Ivana says there's still a problem. I'm not sure if I can solve that problem. I might just have to press on, or I could speak later actually as well, Damien. Yeah, the problem continues. Um, I would say try again, perhaps. I mean, let, let's uh, keep going for another couple of minutes. And if this becomes too problematic, we can move on to Aaron and come back to you. Sure, sure. No problem. Uh, so as I was saying, I do have experience doing research, uh, doing interviews with perpetrators. And these are mostly qualitative interviews. And I've done this over a number of years, I think over about 15 years, and in a number of different contexts. Uh, so in my chapter of the book, I, I focus on what I call the perpetrator imaginary, which is really about the image of the perpetrator. And I argue that our perceptions of perpetrators are situational, that they're derived from our relationship to perpetrators, and that in perceiving perpetrators, we are also attributing things to perpetrators, attributing values to perpetrators, and maybe attributing our own biases as well. So in my chapter, I examined several archetypical perspectives on perpetrators, the artist's perpetrator, the lawyer's perpetrator, the researcher's perpetrator, the victim's perpetrator, and finally, the perpetrator's perpetrator, perpetrator self-image. So what do these understandings, what do these perspectives tell us about understanding our research subjects? In many artistic representations, perpetrators are more metaphorical or even metaphysical than they are real. In a sense, there's no need to represent the personhood of perpetrators in these symbolisms. The perpetrator is an instrument of destruction, of evil, of suffering, of, and of victimization rather than being a multifaceted human being. Artistic representations often seek to distance us as the audience from the perspective perpetrator. The fields of the lawyer and the scholar seem at first glance to be hermetically sealed systems defined by their internal rationality as they see it and attempts at objectivity. Yet in reality, neither imaginary is protected. Rather, they're both influenced by deeper cultural myths and understandings about perpetrators and perpetration. Lawyers, like the other archetypes, are storytellers. The law seeks to produce singular narratives through the outcome of the judicial process, but in order to reach this point, competing stories are tested. The court also reshapes and subordinates narratives which don't align with this final judicial story. In this judicial story, the moment of perpetration is the perpetrator. As researchers, are we identifying with perpetrators if we present their perspective? How do we approach perpetrators without complicity? Is there an ethics of encounter, as Jenny Adams argues? And if so, what does this ethic of encounter constitute? Perhaps such an ethics of encounter is centered on the purpose, and the purpose of the encounter and awareness of the implications of the encounter and decency, of course, and ethical treatment of research subjects. The stories we tell as researchers emerge through a dynamic interplay between researcher, subject, and society. Research among perpetrators thus must be considered for the imaginary that the researcher imposes on their subjects. Researchers strive to be objective, to examine the subject of study with a clear perspective free from assumptions, or rather to transparently acknowledge our assumptions. Yet in transforming actuality into theory, we're ultimately translating perpetration and the perpetrator into an abstraction. The perpetrator is an unloved participant and as a subject may not be seen by the researcher as a fully realized human being. For victims who know their perpetrators personally, Perpetration is both an atrocity and a betrayal. Perhaps for those who are victimized by anonymous perpetrators, uh, the othering of perpetrators gives them a way of preserving their worldview. And of course, it might be unreasonable 
uh, to ask victims to seek empathy with those who have harmed them, their families and their communities. Victims representations of perpetrators are true to their experience of suffering, even if this representation only presents a partial image. Perpetrators themselves, in terms of their self image, often seek to distance self from act. They deny their involvement or they might say, this is what I've done, but this is not who I am. Both victim and perpetrator try to reclaim their identities after mass violence, a quest that is shaped by broader social forces of recognition and denial. Victimization and perpetration are deeply personal experiences, but talking about victimization and perpetration in an interview setting is of course essentially social, where the narrative is produced through interaction between the speakers. The imaginaries outlined in my chapter do differ, but they're intimately connected, a web of presumptions informed by one another, but also grounded in a more universal desire to remain distant from violence and from what's seen as human evil. The perpetrator is often represented as inhuman, as a beast, whether it's in literary representations or juridical representations, such as in the prosecution's opening statement in the Eichmann trial, where he argued that Eichmann was born human, but lived like a beast in the jungle. As these imaginaries make clear, we must not draw too close to the beast. But what can we make in conclusion of all these different perspectives? How can we understand the perpetrator? There can never, of course, be a singular perpetrator, just as there can never be a singular self. The self, as Jean-Paul Sartre noted, is a collection of relations. Selfhood itself is spectral, but the act of perpetration eternalizes a moment in time for perpetrator, victim, and society. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Michelle, for uh, um, this introduction to uh, your chapter or your contribution to the edited volume. Our next speaker and contributor to the volume is uh, co-editor Dr. Irene Jesse, who is a senior lecturer in history at the University of Glasgow. Um, who specialize on oral history, uh, but also on ethnographic fieldwork in uh, conflict-affected settings. She's done fieldwork in Rwanda, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Uganda, and she's the author of Negotiating Genocides in Rwanda, The Politics of History. Uh, Erin, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thanks, you. Thanks, Damien. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Are you all right with the sound for me? Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I was just going to briefly talk about uh, the chapter that I contributed to this edited volume, um, as well as time permitting just the final conclusion to the edited volume as well. Um, so I work primarily on Rwanda. Um, and I mean, like some of the other people here, I've worked with people from all different sides of the conflict, um, particularly what's referred to in official parlance as the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi um, in Rwanda. And um, with the chapter that I contributed to this volume, I was sort of trying to work through this um, disconnect that I experienced during my fieldwork in Rwanda in 2007 and 2008 when I was a doctoral candidate, where I found that the way that I had been sort of um, conditioned to think about perpetrators, um, whom in the Rwandan context are often referred to as genocidaire, um, was very much informed by, you know, popular culture, media images, their presentation in Hollywood films, these kinds of things. Um, but then also as my fieldwork began and I was going around trying to um, acquire the necessary research permissions and so on to, to be able to conduct interviews in the prisons with people who had perpetrated crimes related to the genocide, um, I found this the same kind of um, challenge was, was presented whereby really the, the kind of predominant image um, that I, I was exposed to was these, these genocidaire as, as monsters, as psychopaths, you know, as individuals who'd been sort of um, possessed by Satan and these kinds of things, um, and in other kinds of really, you know, dehumanizing language. Um, but of course, you know, to a certain extent, this was often, I should mention as well, part of a broader effort to make me aware of the potential dangers that I might face as a researcher going into the prisons um, or in other ways talking to people who had perpetrated genocide related crimes. Um, because of course in Rwanda, um, I mean one of the things that the country is probably most well known for internationally 
is its efforts to pursue what Gerald Gahima refers to as universal accountability. So unlike other genocide affected contexts where um, governments or international actors may have attempted to focus on prosecuting high level individuals that they feel bear primary criminal responsibility for these kinds of atrocities. Um, in the Rwandan context, they not only went after sort of high level perpetrators at a kind of official international level through the International Criminal Tribunal for um, Rwanda, but they also then had national court trials um, to deal with some of these perpetrators. And then of course, the very thoroughly studied um, gachacha courts, which were sort of at the grassroots level. And in this manner, um, upwards of 1.9 million cases of genocide related crimes were considered um, across the country, um, really up until about sort of, um, well, yeah, I mean, some of, the, some of the national trials are still going, but up until about 2013, um, when the gachacha trials concluded. Um, and of course, so within this sort of broader structure, I mean, a lot of people talked about genocidaires, but again, you know, the way that they were presented was very much as monsters. Um, and when I then began working um, in the prisons and conducting interviews with people who'd been accused of or found guilty of committing these kinds of crimes, what I very quickly began to realize um, is that the everyday sort of realities and the ways that they made sense of their criminal activities often really pushed back against this idea um, that, they were, that they were monsters or sociopaths and indeed, throughout the interviews that I conducted, um, and I should mention as, as, you know, sort of highlight as Damien mentioned, I do both um, life history interviews and thematic interviews with people going back and interviewing them multiple times over, you know, a period of field work. Um, but then I also do ethnographic work. So I try to sort of embed myself in everyday situations, um, study the political climate in the country around different topics, that kind of thing. Um, and overwhelmingly what came out of these interviews and related interactions I had with people who fit this category of genocidaire was that they really saw themselves as victims um, and victims in a number of really interesting ways. So in this chapter, I highlight, for example, the way in which some of the people I interviewed saw themselves as being victims of what they called historic injustice. So this idea, um, one that's you know grounded in sort of very pseudoscientific understandings of Rwanda's past that were popular um, during the pre-genocide regimes of um, Juvenal Javier Imana and Gregoire Kaibanda, the, the previous presidents. Um, this idea that the Hutu had been enslaved by the Tutsi monarchy that had been in power prior to independence, um, and that they had, you know, in that in that capacity as sort of enslaved people by the monarchy, um, you know, they'd endured all kinds of human rights violations, um, which basically meant then that when faced with the threat of the Tutsi reclaiming power during the civil war that started in Rwanda in 1990, a number of people then became very, very fearful of being re-enslaved um, and that their, their crimes were then sort of grounded in this kind of fear um, and not necessarily a fear of the Tutsi as a sort of ethnic group, but a fear in particular of the RPF as well. Um, and so this then led into a second kind of category of injustice that people talked about, which are these sort of legal and political injustices um, of having been sort of, you know, then prompted to fight against the RPF or fight against the Tutsi in general. Um, and for many of these individuals, these fears were then sort of justified by what they felt was happening in Rwanda in the aftermath of the genocide. Um, because the individuals responsible for having stopped the genocide um, are the RPF, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, which is a predominantly Tutsi party. Um, and a number of the genocide that I interviewed argued that they had effectively then taken control of education and the military and the government. And this meant that the Hutu then were being re-enslaved by effectively a new form of Tutsi monarchy. Um, so these kinds of um, political injustices and then the legal injustices that they associated with processes like Gachacha, like the national courts, like the ICTR, are, um, often came up then as in a way in which the RPF was persecuting the Hutu as an ethnic group. Um, and then finally, I also talk briefly about the potential for gender-based discrimination and, and victimization to also play into this in the sense that some of the women that I interviewed in the prisons who had committed or allegedly committed crimes related to the genocide often felt that the only reason that they had been prosecuted and imprisoned was because they were women who were seen as having violated the kind of um, popular Rwandan gender norms, the roles and so on that women were expected to hear, adhere to, um, which in the Rwandan context means that really women are only celebrated where they're good wives and mothers. And the moment they pick up a weapon and engage in violence, you know, kill people, that kind of thing, then they become really heavily demonized. And they argued more so than men who would commit the same kinds of crimes. Um, so these are some of the main things that I'm discussing in that chapter. Um, 
I'll also just very briefly note that um, the conclusion of this edited volume is also something that we worked really, really hard on. And it's different from a normal conclusion for an edited volume in the sense that what Shell and I have tried to do is pull together common sort of ethical and methodological and theoretical insights from across all of the different contributions in the book in order to put together a kind of code of practice that can be a useful starting point for researchers who want to do qualitative research with perpetrators in different settings. So it lays out a number of questions and ethical considerations and so on that people can use for as a starting point for this kind of research um, and and hopefully as well will be a starting point for further conversation in that regard and I'll, I'll conclude there thank you many thanks Erin our next speaker is uh, Dr Ivana Macek uh, who is an associate professor and senior lecturer at the Department of Social Anthropology at Stockholm University um, she's the author of Sarajevo under siege anthropology in wartime and edited a volume on engaging violence, trauma, memory, and representation. Uh, so Dr. Macek uses uh, an anthropological approaches and her latest research um, <clears throat> focuses on Swedes engagement in global war zones, and most notably on uh, their experience and transmission of experiences among Bosnians in Sweden too. The floor is yours, Dr. Macek. Thank you, Damien. Can, can you hear me? Okay, yes. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Well, uh, this uh, chapter is based on, on my overall experience of working with war from the start of the fall of former Yugoslavia in 91. My experience is from Croatia there. And then my field work in Bosnia from 92 to 96, basically, most of it in Sarajevo. And then uh, also the, the latest thing that Damien mentioned, the the uh, the project with Swedish families uh, with Bosnian families in Sweden. Uh, so uh, this chapter is about uh, how I started thinking what the perpetrator is, and I problematize that all along through through the chapter, the definition and the usefulness of the concept. Uh, and uh, I can and then I move to a, an example of a Bosnian family in Sweden where I exemplify uh, some main points I want to make about context and about the, the entanglements of victims and perpetrators. And I end up with some uh, thoughts on method and how it is closely connected. Both theory, method and ethics cannot really be separated in this field of research. So um, what I started uh, with was I, I thought first, I thought, well, I haven't worked with perpetrators. I'm an anthropologist. I work uh, uh, with a method that's uh, called uh, participant observation, observation, which means that we live with people, we experience things ourselves, we try to understand how the others, how it is to be somebody else by living it as, as, as well as we can. And I was, of course, thinking about Rwanda and genocidaries and, and uh, you know, the, the in famous Nazi prosecutions, and I thought, no, I don't, I haven't worked with uh, perpetrators. But then I realized that, uh, well, soldiers I met in, during my work, both in Croatia and Bosnia, and afterwards in, with Sweden, with, with families in Sweden, um, they were sort of ambiguous and uh, about their guilt, and they could be seen as perpetrators. They're people killing people, killing other people. And then I realized that uh, also people who had uh, uh, who supported nationalistic ideologies in this case were also somehow responsible for uh, for for supporting the killing of the others, and uh, by implication also everybody can be actually responsible for this type of things, including us uh, anthropologists working with people with, with methods that shells uh, touched upon, because we, we identify with our informants and we try to understand them as, as, as well as we can. And uh, in that, my argument is that I, in this case, needed to uh, sort of accept their denial of perpetration, which they did 
in conversations with me, they could not talk about uh, being perpetrators themselves, uh, the soldiers I talked to, or the nationalistic people who supported killing of the others. Um, they uh, Every time their perpetration would come up, they would talk about how they were victims themselves. So the only way to talk about uh, uh, acts of perpetration was talking about victimization. Uh, and this is an ethical dilemma, which is also a methodological one, which brings us to the theoretical problem of talking about perpetrators separated from victims, because in my case, they were very much the same. And we have these cases also in other ethnographical fields, like uh, just in uh, Liberia, for example, the child soldiers or the, the abducted women soldiers. Uh, they're all both victims and perpetrators. And this has also deeper psychological roots, uh, as I show in my, my chapter, uh, because uh, the, they're, psychologically there, there is always a, a part of victimization in a perpetrator and vice versa. Uh, I, I can't go into this now, right? But anyway, uh, the victim and perpetrators are not clearly separated. Also, re recent research on Holocaust shows that. Uh, that uh, and the bystanding is also implicated here, as we as researchers could be sort of put in a bystand in a passive bas bystander position. Often, I, I did feel uh, uh, that way, at least, which implicates us as responsible partly. Um, and the last thing I also argue for, which you've been talking about earlier, also is the context of perpetration, of defining a perpetrator or a victim. And in my articles, it's very, very clear that uh, the, the Swedish context, uh, which defines Serbs as perpetrators per definition and Muslims, Bosniaks as the victims, uh, forced the, my, my informants, the people I met, to also um, feel that way and, and, and in themselves try to, to tackle this, this moral dilemma, uh, which, for example, if a Serb was in Serbia, they would be seen as, a hero, as heroes. So it depends where you are what sort of argument and what sort of moral uh, problems you have in, in a social and ideological national way and legal probably as well. And then there is also the level within ourselves that war actually and war laws, uh, as it was in former Yugoslavia, they allow killing of people and destroying the mat material uh, material things which uh, which is not allowed in, in uh, peace circumstances. And this is always a dilemma for every individual because we all know that we are doing something that we should not. Um, okay, I think I'll end here, except that uh, I have a little suggestion then methodologically or a conclusion from my article. Uh, my chapter, which is the method I've been using in chapter was to listen very closely to, as we could not talk about perpetration openly, I, I had to listen to all the silences and omissions in my interviews and in my meeting with people, uh, their uh, uncomfortable chuckles, their, their hopeless uh, statements like asking questions which they can't, cannot answer. So I think this sort of nuanced uh, uh, methodology, hearing the silences and omission and uh, noticing the affects that people express is necessary for this type of uh, research, as well as, as Shell mentioned, the, the real reflexivity and self-reflexivity. What is my position here? What am I doing? Why are these people saying these things right now to me? And on that note, I'll end. Thank you very much. Um, so we're moving on to our next speaker, um, who is um, Professor Andrea Petto, who is a historian, a professor at the Department of Gender Studies uh, at Central European University in Vienna. Her works focus on gender, politics, Holocaust, and war. 
And recent publications include uh, the women of um, the Arrow Cross Party, Invisible Hungarian Perpetrators in the Second World War, as well as um, forthcoming or recently published, at least in 2021, Forgotten Massacre, Budapest, 1944. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, organizing this panel. Can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank to Erin and Kjell for putting the book together. And as one of uh, my colleagues said that uh, uh, she had edited uh, five books with colleagues and uh, she's not in speaking terms with them. It's obviously a big success that, uh, you know, uh, we are here together and, uh, and discussing this really fantastic volume. And uh, I believe that uh, 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 it was a privilege to be a part of this. So I uh, would like to read my contribution because I was frightening. I was frightened by the seven minute uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, limitation. And uh, uh, I also really enjoyed working in this project because I was working on this um, uh, book on the on the on, uh, on the, the forgotten perpetrators. And uh, this chapter I wrote was a kind of uh, Auspuffer, a kind of, you know, uh, reflecting on the methodological problems of writing this book about this uh, forgotten massacre. So, and uh, I was reflecting on what does it mean to do perpetrator research, Holocaust perpetrator research in an illiberal country, as you know, uh, the Hungarian uh, memory politics had been uh, changed uh, considerably in the past 10 years. So since starting work on this project of researching female perpetrators in the mid uh, 2000s, I have faced new political challenges right, uh, to writing this story. The Hungarian government, together with other countries that uh, were under German and Soviet occupation during the Second World War, canonized the narrative of double occupation and relegated all responsibility for war crimes to the occupying forces. It is not simple to place the dark patches of the past into an ethnocentric memory politics, especially when there are competing remembrances. The illiberal populist turn in historiography has changed the way that history is written in Hungary. First, the government funded parallel research institutes and museums, which were created without transparency and quality assurance. Second, the historians appointed to work in these institutions started to write popular books, filling in the void left by professional historians who published only for their narrow academic circles. And third, public interest in history, especially related to the Second World War, increased considerably. Given the circumstances, I decided to write a book that focused on the history of Piroshka Deli uh, for a popular audience. And this chapter explores the story of writing this book. This was a strategic, theoretical, and methodological decision informed by the recent attack on gender studies that uh, has forced my institution, Hungary's Central European University, into political exile in Vienna. My response was to approach this very thorny topic of women perpetrators in an accessible way. However, a consequence of my attempt with the best intention to, foot my, to fit my research in this changing frame of remembrance is that I risk silencing survivors, rendering invisible Hungarian collaboration in war crimes and contributing to the historical revisionism related to the Second World War in Hungary. So the heroine, Piroshka Deli, was sentenced, uh, of this book, sentenced to death and executed for her role in 19 murders that she helped perpetrate in Budapest on the 15th of October, 1944. Her case is truly symbolic, and there are a plethora of sources related to the massacre. People's tribunals, materials, newspaper articles, survivor recollections, and the plague set up at the massacre's location. At that time, it was an atypical massacre in Budapest, as it was not acceptable to murder people in their own homes. Before the German occupation of March 19, 1944, the Hungarian state exported its killings of civilians. On 16th of June 1944, the mayor of Budapest had issued a decree forcing Jews to move into approximately 2,000 houses 
that had been marked with yellow stars and designated to house the Jewish population of Budapest ahead of the planned deportations. After the German occupation, the state assisted the deportation of 500,000 citizens to concentration and death camps. It was only after the 15th of October 1944, however, that the Arab Cross Party took over, at which point massacres in homes and hospitals became a common practice by Hungarian citizens. Delhi, the heroine of this book and the story, a divorced mother of two, a war nurse, arrived on the day of the Arrow Cross takeover at the house, marked with a yellow star, close to the Arrow Cross headquarters, the uniformed male companions. Delhi and his companions shot 19 Jewish civilians on the spot and drove the other, uh, and drove the other ways with the intention of deporting them to Germany, and the, but the deportation never occurred owing the chaotic war situation. She was arrested in February 1945 in Budapest when fights were still occurring in Western Hungary and in Buda, and she was executed on the 23rd of March 1946. During the Delhi trial, her trial, it was discussed whether the janitor family called Samocheta, who at that time were the, Chang uh, uh, were the Changuri State's sole Christian residents, had any connection to the massacre. Their house had been marked with yellow star in the summer of 1944, but they remained in the house. They took advantage of their position of power, blackmailing and stealing from Jewish residents of the house, and this family was arrested during the spring of 1946, convicted and sentenced to multiple years in prison. However, it remained unclear during their trials what role this janitor family, the Sabochatas, has played in inviting Aerocross to the house. So recent studies of the Holocaust focus on the victims and perpetrators, but unless they are high profile, politicians are typically uh, overlooked. A similar tendency has emerged in development of perpetrator research inspired by German and Austrian scholarship with 20 year delay, as far as research on family members of executed war criminals are concerned. In Hungary, it is mostly literary works that focus on the so-called ordinary Hungarian perpetrator. So thus, I decided to map the topography of memory of one perpetrator family and these are the Samochatas, the janitors. To inform this project, I interviewed survivors, but I also wanted to introduce the perpetrator's perspective. This focus prompted first of many ethical questions. How can I present the view of the perpetrators in a country that is spearheading historical revisionism of the Holocaust and the Second World War? Could the focus on this research take attention from survivors whose memories are already under attack in Hungary. This interview allowed me to identify two preliminary tendencies in the memories of family members of Hungarian perpetrators. The first is the unconditional admiration for the father and the grandfather, which is only partly an effect of their touch up biographies. This admiration could also be interpreted from a, a psychological point of view. There was no need for distancing oneself from the father's politics, unlike in Germany or in Austria, because the father was more easily portrayed as a victim of communism than was an active war criminal. The second tendency related to the ultimate ineffectiveness of post-war punishment. Not only because this family kept quiet about the 10 years of imprisonment to which uh, the, uh, the, the father was sentenced, even in front of his immediate family, but also because he depicted himself as a victim of a communist political trial, which left a lasting mark on the family's memory. The suffering of the Samochet of the janitor's family endured under communism became the so-called cover story that concealed the necessity of confronting the crimes committed during the Second World War. Thus the subject of the interview the son, Nador Samocheta, is not a product of collective memory, but he is a producer and dispatcher of that memory. The victimization and rationalization narratives of perpetrators' children have major impact on collective 
memory in Hungary. And that is what my chapter is exploring. Thank you. Uh, you're muted, Damien. Thank you, thank you. That was going to happen anyway. Um, and thanks, yep. So our next um, speaker is uh, Eva Van Ruckel, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at uh, Vrede Universiteit Amsterdam. Uh, she researches and teaches about violence, human rights, morality, and natural resources in Latin America. So we're changing uh, continent possibly here. And her first monograph is uh, Phenomenal Justice, Violence, and Mor Morality in Argentina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Damien. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance because they're renovating the house. These are the perils of working at home, but I think it will be fine for the upcoming minutes. Um, my chapter is about, uh, it's titled Getting Close with Perpetrators in Argentina is firmly grounded in my uh, PhD research uh, that I started now more than 10 years ago. And I also like it, I have the book here. Um, I remember sending the draft to Aaron and Kiel and I had just finished the draft that was to be submitted to the committee. So quite some time has passed and it shows how much in Davier and work uh, the editors have put into it. Um, for which I'm very grateful as well. I would like to talk a little bit more on what Ivana already introduced um, on the role of silence when you work with perpetrators. Um, and I think the chapter very well provides a very ethnographic in-depth reading of what silence means when you involve with perpetrators uh, through our methods of participant observation. Um, before I went to Argentina, I was very aware that I would be studying both sides. That was what I wanted. So I wanted to go to Argentina and delve into the atrocities uh, of the 70s that were now being, uh, are being prosecuted again uh, at domestic trials. And um, the whole idea was to really get a gripple with this search for justice from both sides. So I already knew I really wanted to engage with the victims a perspective and with the perpetrator's perspective. Um, but I was not aware of that I, uh, with this choice of uh, doing research among perpetrators, I was about to embark into a local mall world of military officers from many different ranks and files uh, that had, to my opinion, very different ideas of how to live with violence. And the chapter, what I really try to show is a little bit of the ethical dilemmas also when you work with people who are being convicted for crimes against humanity, how you approach them, how you can be with them. And I remember also with the conversations with Aaron and Kjell, I always said, I could never call them perpetrators. That was just simply impossible if, if I would have approached them and used the word repressor, which is uh, the Spanish word for perpetrator, it would not have been even possible to do research among them. And I think that's very well also implies with the term of genocide. In the case of Argentina, uh, the whole um, well debate on genocide is also very political. Legally and formally, it's not coined as such, but if you engage with victims, uh, it's a very yeah, common used uh, word to kind of dominate also the cruelty of crimes. Uh, but of course, within uh, the world of the perpetrators, this was not the case. And I think it very well shows all these political meanings that are attached to these concepts and words that we all use when we analyze and talk about uh, violence as scholars. And I think what I trace in this chapter are two things. It's mostly uh, one thing, what does it mean that you become implicated in the silence of crimes against humanity, which I state was unavoidable, I could not do that, otherwise I could not have been able to do research among them. So also what Ivana spoke about, you really need to become attentive to, yeah, listening to silence. And it's not that, um, here it is, one second, this is the renovating of the house. <laughs> Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> um, that being attentive to silence, I learned that it's not uh, implicit the, the meaning of denial. I think if we read a lot about perpetrators and that they don't talk about the crimes, that it's a strategic behavior to circumvent um, 
accountability or it's a way of simply denying the crimes. And I really lived it through that their silences were not uh, a means of denying the crimes, but much more a way of dealing with um, violence in their everyday lives. And I also uh, tried to trace uh, the meanings of silence in all these different aspects um, in everyday life and also really try to analyze the chuckles and the, the laughter and when you try to probe something and it not, it's not happening. I think there is a lot of um, yeah, under theorizing uh, material left that we uh, scholars interested in perpetration should look at. So not only to the words, but also to the silences. On the other hand, the other topic, which is less methodological, perhaps how do you do research among perpetrators is much more related to um, yeah, the implications of when you write about uh, perpetrators as well. And I think um, it has been an enormous moral struggle in the field, but also writing up the findings and also now knowing that these pieces are traveling uh, in a academic world, but also in people uh, personally uh, involved in uh, this particular past in Argentina. And I cannot say anymore that I only understand or something. I think the dilemma of understanding and justification is something that very, is very important to take into account when you start kind of putting emphasis on, okay, if we wanna understand violence, we need to go to who those who are also involved in perpetrating crimes. I think the balance between understanding and justification is always something that you need to, to, to take into account. And I have also, and I think this is perhaps prone to anthropologists who are so inflicted in their subject. I've had also a lot of discussion when I end the chapter also with this, that with colleagues in Argentina and uh, friends and informants, they always warned me to not get too close to perpetrators because I would change perhaps too much and my perspective would be too troubled and I could not have a clear vision on the atrocities anymore. And I think this continues to be an ongoing dilemma that in terms of theorizing on empathy, um, silence, I think it's something that has not ended and this is just a, a snapshot. And I also try to explore it in newer work in which I try to kind of extrapolate that silence into audiovisuals. So I think this dilemma is ethical and methodological um, in two ways. And I would like to end with a small quote from the chapter and then I'm going to stop otherwise I take too much time I believe. Um, I say I believe that those interested in getting close to perpetration must continuously reflect on this continuum of understanding and justification. How other people interpret and judge the stories of the perpetrators in Argentina varies greatly and the social implications of ethnographies on perpetrators perhaps carry even a greater responsibility because the line between knowledge and ignorance is thin and flexible and obviously depends on its audience. And this is what I said. This is why some of my Argentinian friends and colleagues, they think it's better to leave certain people and topics such as perpetrators and perpetrators, perpetration understudied or even unstudied. So this is also perhaps, perhaps crazy to close off, but I'm still not convinced or, well, what we tend to say in this uh, arena of uh, studies of violence that we need also to include the perpetrators to have a fuller understanding, but that comes with certain implications and is it all worth it? I don't know. That's a question I would like to pose to the audience as well. And I'll leave it to there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and our last uh, contributor and presenter before we move on to um, the discussion and the discussion is um, Tim Williams, who is a junior professor um, of insecurity and social order at the Bundeswehr University Munich in Germany. He's the co-editor in chief of ZEFCO Studies in Peace and Conflict and a member of the executive board of the International Associations of Genocide Scholars. Uh, his research deals with violence and focuses on its dynamics, particularly at the micro level. He's conducted field research in Cambodia and Rwanda, and he's the author of the book, The Complexity of Evil, Perpetration and Genocide, published in 2020. Tim, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much. Um, and a particular thanks to Shell and Erin for putting this um, volume together. It was um, it was a great process uh, going through the different workshops um, and uh, panels that we've had in the past. And um, uh, I agree uh, with Andrea that it's not, uh, not uh, obvious that we would all be getting on by the end of this process with each other. So, uh, and that's very much due to your constructive uh, and helpful uh, management of this process, so thank you. Um, I'm going to be very brief um, talking about my chapter. Uh, basically what I try to do in the chapter is think a little bit methodologically about um, how we can identify perpetrators in the field. Um, and uh, here in my, re, uh, in my field research uh, itself in Cambodia, um, I avoid the term perpetrator um, with the people I'm working with within the communities I'm working in. Um, but this has methodological consequences in terms of uh, the sampling. And so basically this chapter is only looking at a very small question methodologically um, of, of how can we find perpetrators? How can we sample from the population? And I, I realize uh, sampling is a very uh, sort of political science uh, way of, uh, of phrasing it, but it's how can we find perpetrators? In a society uh, in which uh, many perpetrators claim victimhood and in which this victimhood is also accepted by many, uh, within this society. So I was, um, the, it, the context of the project that I was working on uh, in which this chapter then uh, developed uh, was uh, asking uh, about perpetrator motivations, why people had participated um, in the genocide in Cambodia. So I was basically trying to identify um, former Khmer Rouge. Um, I had, obviously it's, it, uh, my research was um, in 2014, 2015. So it had been several decades since uh, the genocidal violence in Cambodia. Um, and I'd originally planned to, um, to <clears throat> focus on two different locations. Um, and try and identify a range of different perpetrators within these um, within these spaces. And so I had a relatively broad understanding of uh, what constitutes the perpetrator, going beyond killers to also people who are more broadly implicated in the process of arresting, guarding, um, giving orders, um, compiling lists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the people I was looking for, though, didn't see themselves, similar as to what Ivana was saying, um, they didn't see themselves as perpetrators. Um, and more so than in other cases, they um, they claim victimhood uh, for themselves as also having um, suffered extreme insecurity under the regime. Um, and many of their um, comrades also having been killed within internal purges. And so the question for me is, well, how do I deal with this um, methodologically, um, with trying to approach a population that doesn't see themselves as part of the population that I see them as part of, they don't see themselves as perpetrators, um, and they're also not widely known as such. There have not been any uh, judicial processes, there have only been very high level judicial processes, there's not been any truth um, seeking processes. So um, it was basically hidden populations uh, that I was trying to identify. Um, and so uh, originally I entered the field with the idea of doing um, respondent driven sampling, which is basically uh, an uh, idealized way of uh, conducting snowballing uh, within uh, hidden populations of at-risk um, populations. So originally it was developed um, for, for other types uh, of populations, um, but it, uh, it lives off, oh dear, sorry, my battery's obviously this is the moment the computer decides to tell me I need to plug in, sorry about that. Um, uh, it asks you to basically ask for multiple references, but for the contact to be made by um, by the person who you've had as the, as the original seed um, and approach them yourselves in order to build trust. And this works quite well within tight-knit communities. Um, and this didn't work methodologically for me. So basically in the chapter, what I do is I then try and explain why it didn't work uh, and what I learned from this process. Um, and this is mostly due to the fact that there was a, a lack of social ties um, and absolutely no networks between uh, former Khmer Rouge um, today. Either, uh, there were two options, uh, either this was genuine, that they genuinely didn't have any uh, contact any longer to former comrades, um, or they were very hesitant to unmask uh, other people um, as uh, former Khmer Rouge. Mm, I'm 
pretty certain it was the former that they genuinely didn't have any contact because of the the way in which they uh, had the the uh, the regime ended, the way people population movements uh, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, it's it's very plausible that they no longer uh, have any contact. Also, they had no incentives not to talk to me because the people were gen who I did speak to were very open uh, with me. Um, but the bigger problem, uh, besides the fact that they couldn't help me um, because they didn't know any people, it was a, a more, I guess, a more ethical uh, question, which intersects with this methodological one, is that the people see themselves um, as victims, which for the project itself wasn't problematic. Um, but it did mean that it was difficult to engage with them in terms of trying to define the types of people who I wanted. So I would define the people through the roles that they had, um, similar to, to the ones that they were in. But again, I, I constantly uh, was challenging them I, I was I was challenged to not be unmasked, asking them to unmask people from uh, having committed crimes, etc., because this would conflict with their own um, self definitions. Also, um, in legal terms, uh, this could have been problematic as well because of confidentiality, because of the hybrid tribunal, the ECCC. Um, now, while the people I was speaking to as low-level perpetrators were very would not have been um, charged at the ECCC, they could very well have been um, interesting to the prosecution in terms of being witnesses. And then it would have been outside of my control of how they are um, perceived and portrayed at the tribunal. And so for me, this was quite um, uh, an unsettling prospect um, of, the, uh, of the, the, my sampling strategy, basically revealing other people and them not having the control over how they self-define. Um, so in the end, uh, I, I, in the chapter, I, I detail uh, this, my slightly different approach to this, which um, follows much closer to standard uh, ethnographic uh, methods of identifying individuals, um, and how I conducted the interviews to, um, to allow people to self-define in the ways that they want, um, and to not uh, have to um, unmask other people. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back over to Damien. Many thanks. Um, so we uh, now move on to the discussion part. Before we move on to the Q&A, though, we do have a discussant here uh, to whom I'm giving 10 minutes to um, engage with uh, the different contributions that we heard about. So our discussion today is uh, Professor Jim Waller, who is a Cohen Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at King State College. He's also the Director of Academic Programs for the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities. He's the author of several books. I'm just going to pick two of them. Uh, one of them is Becoming Evil, uh, How Ordinary People Commit Genocide and Mass Killings. And the other one, Confronting Evil, Engaging Our Responsibility to Prevent Genocide, both of them at Oxford University Press. The floor is yours for 10 minutes of discussion. Thank you, Damien. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect, thank you. And thanks to all the contributors and, uh, and to uh, Shell and Aaron's gracious invitation to be part of the discussion for this launch of this very important book. Um, I think in terms of my comments, I wanna reflect a bit on where the field has been and the ways in which the contributions of this book, and you've heard many of those here from the six people who have spoken, how they fit uh, the gaps that have still occur in this very young and growing field of understanding perpetrator behavior. My work in the field started actually in the early 1990s uh, with an introduction through a mutual friend to Christopher Browning, who at that time was teaching in Washington State, uh, where I was also teaching. Uh, Chris was beginning work on the book that would become Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101 in Poland. And as a historian, he had felt that he had done at that point a good amount of work on who, what, when, and where, but he was struggling to reach the question of why. And I was introduced to him as someone who came from the field of social psychology who might help in understanding this question, this issue of why, how do people come to commit this type of extraordinary evil? So my entree into the field was through Chris's work. I began through that relationship with him to attend conferences in Holocaust studies where 
the majority of the focus, and I think this is still true today, was focused on the victims, on bystanders, on survivors, a good amount on resistors and rescuers, given how few of those we actually have in cases of genocide, a tremendous amount of interest in that, but relatively little on perpetrator behavior. And I began to recognize there through the 90s as I was uh, starting to immerse myself in this field that we knew, particularly in Holocaust studies, far more about the macro level mechanics of how mass murder happens than we knew about the micro level of the men and women who carried out those atrocities. You could read, for instance, the predominant books in Holocaust studies at the time, the histories of the Holocaust, and you could read the entirety of the book, 500, 600, 700 pages, get to the end of it, close it. And if someone asked you who committed the murders, all you could pull up was, well, there's Hitler, there's Himmler, there's Goering, there's Goebbels, it's just the high ranking architects we knew and we discussed very little until Chris's book about the low level rank and file killers. So my entrance into the field and my interest in it was in understanding the psychology of the behavior of the rank and file killers. And that's what led to the first edition of Becoming Evil in 2002, predominantly based on archival research because I had no sense of how would one go about doing the interviews necessary for this type of work. So the first edition of Becoming Evil in 2002, predominantly based on archival work, but the difficulty I found with archives was not really issues of accessibility, but more issues of the interrogations, the questions, the documents always went in a different direction than I wished to go. I wished as a psychologist that the questions would go in a different direction. And I realized pretty quickly that it would be up to me to do the face-to-face -face interviews with alleging evicted perpetrators to try and get at the questions I wanted to get at as a social psychologist. And that has led over the years to about 225 of those face-to-face -face interviews around the world, a wide range of case studies, which led to the second edition of Becoming Evil in 2007 and a third edition forthcoming in 2022. All of that work and you haven't heard much about this from the presentations today, but I suspect it's there. All of that work personally was isolated and isolating. There weren't people who worked in the field at that time on those particular topics of study. So you felt very isolated in the work you did. And the work you did in such a specific area of rank and file killers brought you into contact with people that also left you, that also had the impact of being very isolating in some important ways. And I think it took me several years to understand the ways in which the work had an impact on who I was as a researcher for sure, but also who I was as a person. I think what I appreciate the, about the volume that we're launching today and the book we're recognizing is three things that it does in response to the growth of a very niche field that still has particularly certain gaps in it. And I think there are three contributions that I'm struck by in the book. The first is that it continues the push for disciplinary diversity, that this is not simply a question for historians to address, it is a question for anthropologists, for legal scholars, it is a question for people from the humanities, from the wide range of social sciences, that there is a multidisciplinary investment in addressing questions of perpetrator behavior. But more than simply multidisciplinary, and I love what people have said today so far about working in an edited book, by the time you get to the end of it, and we've all been there, you never wanna to speak to these people again. That's not the case in this book. These are scholars and people who have wanted to stay in connection with each other. And what that moves us from is multidisciplinary study to interdisciplinary study, because the book has, has been built on the conversations between disciplines, between people who work in disciplines that are so important for the growth of this specific field. So I applaud certainly the multi 
disciplinary focus of the book as well as the interdisciplinary spirit of it. I think secondly, what the book offers us is a tremendous uh, diversity of case studies. Again, it took a long time for our discussions of perpetrator behavior to leave the realm of Holocaust studies. But here you see in the book, Cambodia, Argentina, Hungary, Rwanda, a beautiful diversity of case studies that again, helps expand our understanding of how people come to commit these atrocities and how we view the people who come to commit these atrocities. And the third thing I appreciate, appreciate about the book, and I wish I had had two decades ago, was its strong focus on methodology. That really is the hallmark of the book. When I started doing the interviews after the first edition of Becoming Evil came out in 2002, and I started working my way into the process of interviewing perpetrators from around the world, there was no guideline for that. There was no training for that. I had had a strong methodological background as a social psychologist, but not in situations of post-conflict societies, not in situations of interviewing alleged or convicted perpetrators of these type of mass atrocities. So there was a lot of trial and error in those early years of doing these, these re this research. And I'll absolutely confess to much more error than success in many of those cases. I think for me, and this is brought up several times in the volume, there were issues of positionality, of recognizing my own positionality, but also recognizing the point at which positionality becomes transformed into bias and trying to, while recognizing my positionality, not also then find myself walking into a bias as I was doing these interviews. I think Ivana and others have mentioned today the ways in which you realize as you go into this methodologically that it's often so much, not so much what is said that is important in the interview process. It is what is unsaid. It's the omissions. It's the silences. It's the very awkward and ill-timed episodes of laughter or grins or, or facial features or affect or body position that over time you start to learn to read and read into and those things become an important part of the interview process. So this methodological contribution I think is a significant one in addition to the multi and, and interdisciplinary contributions as well as the diversity of case studies. Going forward, what I see is important for the next steps is the transformation of what we're studying in an academic sense to contribute to theory, to research and methodology and thinking about it more in terms of prevention. In other words, why does this study matter? Does it matter beyond our resumes, our vetoes, our reputations, our positions, our promotions? Does it matter because it has importance for making never again a reality? There was a famous evolutionary biologist who was once asked about the importance of his field of study. And I found his answer insightful. He said, it's not important because I study it, but I study it because it's important. And for me, when we think about the field of perpetrator behavior, I find myself pushing in that direction. This is not important because I happen to study it. I study it because it's important. And that until we can come to some sense of understanding, which this volume tries to do, how perpetrators come to commit what they do, we have no hope of preventing it. So I hope the next step for us, I hope the next volume for us is thinking very deeply and intently about why this matters in terms of prevention and how we can use what we have learned to try to make never again a reality. So Damien, thank you. Thanks to all the contributors. And Damien, I'll turn it back to you now. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, so uh, rather than give some time to the contributors to respond to Jim's comments and, uh, and praises for the book, um, I suggest that we engage with some of the questions that uh, the audience has been asking. So I'll take them by um, order. Um, and uh, um, I would say, um, um, yes, please, for the, the 
and at least turn on your camera when you want to answer to um, uh, one of the questions. The first question was asked by uh, Shayna Plot, who's asking a question um, on positionality. Um, so let me just uh, briefly um, uh, read or paraphrase the question. So um, Shayna is wondering how positionality affected the research process for each of the contributors, uh, meaning or, or considering the choice of topic, as well as the type of gatekeepers that you uh, gatekeepers, sorry, that you use to recruit participants to get agreement for interviews, to conduct interviews, and specifically how you uh, 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 navigated how much to disclose, not to disclose. Uh, and whether your ideas uh, about the research itself and, and have evolved and, and your position within the research process evolved throughout the research process. Uh, so on the question of positionality, um, since Eva has turned her uh, camera on, do you want to start um, and uh, uh, address this question? Okay, uh, it's just a, a thing I got used to that I like my students to do too. <laughs> but uh, yes, I can say something about positionality. I think what I learned most in the field is you're not really in control that, to whom to speak. And uh, particularly in a very closed world of uh, military officers uh, convicted for crimes against humanity. It's, uh, yeah, it's just you meet someone and there is a certain trust so you start talking and this person trusts you enough and then puts you in contact with someone else so i did not really have a choice so i'm going to talk to this person or or this perpetrator and not this one um and how my own positionality um do you mean my own background and how that affected my relationship um well i can say something about this in relation to silence, I somehow felt very comfortable sometimes not to speak about the atrocities, although it was at the very core of our relationship that we would be talking about it, but I kind of also liked to circumvent that topic. So that says something about me as well, of course. And sometimes in the opposite, I uh, engaged a lot with victims and sometimes I, I had very much trouble to be engaging over and over and over again with the crimes. So yeah, that of course uh, uh, is implicated in research. Um, how in, in the terms of disclosure, uh, there was one thing that always remained very important to me that everyone knew that I was talking to as the victims and perpetrators. So um, I did not speak of details, but I always said to everyone, yeah, I want you to know that I always, that I also engage with people who inflicted the crimes or suffers the crimes and particularly the victims that was very problematic. And it, um, it put some of my relationships with victims uh, in perils as well, I can speak. It was not an easy thing to do, no. But I'll leave the floor to others, yeah. Any other colleague wants to speak to the question of positionality again? Maybe we can get one or two more reactions from uh, the contributors. Yeah, Andrea. Thank you for this question. What I learned is that when the book is out, then you know the author is dead. So the book has got its own life story. I mean, this book will also have its life story. But what I learned from the Hungarian edition of the, uh, the female perpetrator story is that, uh, you know, I hope to change the, of course, I mean, hubris, what, what do historians want? Change, right? I wanted to change the historical narrative uh, about perpetrators and, uh, and the engendered aspects of perpetration. And what happened is that uh, uh, the it was basically used as a supporting argument of the revisionist uh, history writing and proving the uh, arguments of the government, uh, you know, double victimhood theory. So no matter that you hope to produce an extremely nuanced feminist analysis, at the end you find yourself quoted by the far right uh, 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 author saying that even Andrea Petru said, you know, that this is the case. So, I mean, I think we also have to think about the impact of our work because it's, you know, as uh, uh, Professor Waller said, you know, it's fine that we are thinking about our resumes, but, you know, what is the wider implication of our work? And uh, I see that we have got very limited, uh, uh, you know, power over this. Thank you. Any of the contributors wants to add something? Otherwise, I will move on to um, the next question. 
Shall I just move on? Okay. Um, so we have a, a question uh, of a, a different style uh, from uh, Healy Mudrik, even Ken, uh, that is more of a, a legal question. Um, so the question poses here uh, the legal distinction between genocide and other types of grave crimes, especially crimes against humanity. Uh, and the question uh, is, did you research, especially those who were doing field work and interviews with perpetrators, identify distinctions in the perpetrator's motivation? Were they aware of that distinction? Um, did they speak about it or indicate it in any other ways? And I would broaden the question, not just to those that have done interviews, but those that have worked with um, uh, perhaps archives and documents to, is this something that comes back again and again and is very clear? So is the law, uh, um, uh, are, are basically you sources really aware of the law uh, uh, or not? And this distinction or not? Shell. So this is something I've also thought about because I'm straddling this kind of legal and social science world. And I published an article in the Journal of International Criminal Justice uh, dealing with intent and looking at my interviews. And I've interviewed maybe about 200 perpetrators. I'm not sure in Rwanda, Burundi, Bosnia, Cambodia, Bangladesh, basically a bunch of places. But long story short, I mean, I've, and I've also interviewed people of different ranks, I should say, from kind of cabinet ministers and senior leaders with foot soldiers. But long story short, I think many perpetrators probably don't have genocidal intent in terms of the intent to destroy the group in whole or in part, which I know is kind of a contradictory thing. How could you be a perpetrator of genocide without genocidal intent? But uh, I think this intent is kind of fictive in the sense that it, it implies a grandiosity of purpose, which I think many low-level perpetrators don't necessarily have. So I guess that's that's all I would say about that. And some of them are aware of the law. I mean, I even interviewed somebody in Rwanda who'd done a, a course at Yad Vashem before becoming a perpetrator, which I think is a, an interesting story. Uh, but at any rate, some are aware of the law, but most wouldn't be very aware of the legal characterizations. But I know Aaron and Tim have also, not to put you on the spot, but I know you've also worked on this issue. Let's hear from Tim. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to the, the legal understandings, although I am very certain uh, that none of the people who I interviewed would have had a, a clear grasp of the legal uh, ramifications of what they were doing, m for the most part, because uh, most of the people I was speaking to had very little education, um, full stop. So I think a, a sort of a legal understanding would be precluded. Um, at the same time, um, people had very keen understandings of how they were acting, what they were doing, and how they were embedded within the social structures that they were acting within. And so um, my book that uh, you mentioned that uh, was published last year, Complexity of Evil, tries to look at the motivations of why people are, are acting the way they do. And But much as we don't explicitly on a day-to-day -day basis reflect necessarily on exactly why we're acting in different ways. People are not necessarily going to know exactly why they were acting in these ways. It's something that they did, it's something they engaged with, but they not necessarily have a sort of a checklist of this is why I was doing it. But at the same time, there is an understanding of the situations they were in and why they were acting. So having longer conversations with people and trying to understand the situations and to trying to reflect on that can then sort of bring these motivations to the, to the fore without them being able to sort of fill out a questionnaire in which they would be able to say this is this is the three motivations or this is the one motivation. And I would say that, that this also has something to do with what Shell was saying um, about the intent, that it's not necessarily an explicit knowledge or an explicit intent that people are engaging in, but it's a it's an awareness of the situation that they're in. It's an awareness of the general ramifications of what their actions will have and how it relates to the broader social structures. Um, and I think that's why it's so interesting to talk to these people and to try and understand uh, how it, it works. It's, um, yeah, and to try and, try and uh, the, my sort of approach is to try and then systematize that and just to try and compare that between different, different people. Thank you. Erin? Yeah, I would just maybe add to that as well. I mean, working in Rwanda, um, obviously there's been so many different transitional justice type initiatives um, that, that perpetrators of, of genocide related crimes have been subject to. A lot of them are very aware, maybe not of this issue of genocidal intent per se, but very aware of this idea that, you know, their crimes are understood by 
you know, the society, the government, et cetera, as being motivated by this deep seated ethnic hatred towards the Tutsi. Um, and yet when we sort of broke down like individual acts, um, individual crimes they may have committed and this kind of thing, that ethnic hatred very, very rarely actually came through in, you know, when we tried to sort of talk about why they might have done something. Um, not only as, as Tim mentions, did, did people talk about many different kinds of motivations or many different kinds of factors that might have prompted them to participate in genocide related crimes. But those would often sort of shift over time. So they might be motivated in one instance because they really didn't like this individual, but then the other instance they're being forced to by group, right? And so, so people's motivations, when they look at it in the grander scheme of things in terms of the genocide as a whole, were often really, really complicated. And so from that perspective, um, a lot of people really rejected this idea that, you know, their crimes were really just about ethnic hatred and, and by extension then maybe genocidal intent, even though this is very much the attitude of the various courts and, and gachacha tribunals and so on that prosecuted them. Thank you, Erin. Um, I'm going to try to um, merge three questions into one here. Um, it seems to me that the question that uh, Stevan Bozanich, uh, Susan Nittle and um, uh, Gillian Labranche asking are all about access to sources, basically, and some of the constraints that are caused by the different types of sources that you've worked on for this volume. So Stevan says that as a historian, of course, he cannot interview uh, his sources, uh, um, um, or at least some of them, and cannot do an ethnography of his sources. So he has to deal with documents uh, that can sometimes couch some of the issues that you're dealing with in, in rather banal terms. Um, so he's wondering really, um, what is the detriment here? What are we losing when we're working with documents and how much awareness should we have, should we have of that? And we have similar questions that are being asked by uh, Susan and, and Gillian here, uh, but more about kind of field work and interview process. Uh, how do you negotiate access to your sources? And again, with interviews, you know, wh what might you lose when you're using an interpreter, for example? Um, uh, how can you deal with that on a, on a practical level uh, uh, with these kind of uh, more methodological problems, let's say? so. To put it broadly again, it's a question of access to sources and how we treat our sources uh, when we conduct this kind of research. Any taker among the contributors? Um, yes, Eva? Sorry, I was still muted. I think to Stevan's question, I, I kind of feel that documents uh, can also be silent, right? So in a sense, the silences that I encounter as an anthropologist in the field, or the euphemisms that the perpetrator used in how to speak about the past, it seems very similar to these dry documents that you work with. So in a sense, I don't really feel that it's very different. I think it, it's kind of part and partial when you deal with violence that there are silences and blind spots. And I think we should go there. I think it is important. So um, I think it's similar. I don't see it as a detriment. It's different kind of silence, but yeah, because you work with a different material, but in the end, I think uh, it's similar, at least how I see. And I don't have the problem with the translations in terms of uh, inter interpreters. Perhaps someone else can say something about that. Perhaps Ivana could talk a bit more about access to sources as, a, as an anthropologist. Um, you know, how do you find your sources? Uh, how do you embed yourself uh, um, uh, within the kind of uh, everyday routines, let's say, and, 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 and learn from them? Well, the thing, this is very different for us anthropologists because as anthropologists, you really need to get close to people. I mean, as you said, embed yourself in, in uh, certain society and with certain people like when i was working in sweden i had very many similarities to the people i worked with uh, we were all we, we were all in the bosnian war we were all the parents to children who were born and raised in sweden so we had a lot of similar things uh, and uh, this makes this is what i was saying this makes you uh, sort of the anthropological ethnographic method is different in this way because you or yeah partly different i agree with what Eva said about documents but that's another story but anyway when we work with live people in in the present you need to um 
you are in a way becoming as as them in a way you identify in a way you need to do that i think jim was talking about that a bit as well it's somehow you need to to let your informants and what their lives and what they've experienced also get into you it's a bit like psychologist work as well you need to sort of integrate your material or what's what's happening out there and and you need to be, build all that trust to get relevant things so that people just don't tell you the the general story that they know is okay to tell to anybody on the street or to your journalist or uh, you need to get this special confidential private things and for that you need to be private too in a way and very personal and meaningful in an existential way in this sort of questions um so th this is sort of access we we need to build and i feel it's a bit different from what the, the people were asking but on the other hand, it touches to what Jim was saying about how this sort of research affects us as researchers and my whole volume, uh, which I did with uh, colleagues about uh, engaging violence is about that, how it affects us. Thank you. Uh, does any contributor want to address the question of uh, translation and, and the risk of losing some um, some useful um, or, or the risk that that, that disposes to the um, um, confidence in the data, I guess, that you collect. Shell. So this is this is something that's in the volume quite a lot, I think. This issue of translators and translation and research assistants and something Erin and I have talked about a lot. But I mean, it's it's complicated. Obviously, it's I, I would say it's better if you can speak the language, but that might not be possible, especially if you're doing really broadly comparative work. So then I guess that the real, there are a couple of considerations there. One is to, to know your research assistant well, to train them well, to know where they're coming from. But the other one for me as well, and, and I'm not sure if you want to add something, Aaron, but the other one for me is just to, to cross check their work. So maybe somebody is interpreting during the interview, but also to have somebody different uh, to actually transcribe and retranslate the interviews, I find very useful because sometimes you find that there were things that were missed by the person who was doing the interpreting uh, or that they're just summarizing too much. So this, this translation thing definitely can mediate, I think, the, the understanding of what you're doing. Tim, a reaction? Yeah, I just wanted to add something. I, I would agree that in principle, it's better to be able to speak the language. Um, but that, I, I mean, from working uh, in Cambodia, I have seen a lot of colleagues sort of work with lots of different people and seeing a translator more as just a sort of a, a technician. Um, whereas when I, I made the very conscious decision to hire someone for nine months to work with me full time in, during the whole process um, and to spend a lot of time at the beginning acquainting him with the project and I made sure that it was not a professional translator but a historian who understood the context understood the concepts that I was going for so that we could work on the issues together so for me that was a, a way around it to try and work together with someone who would then um, understand why I was asking these kinds of questions uh, and to to be able to engage with the topic um, as much as the words which are being spoken um, and that worked uh, I, I, I believe uh, quite well for me. So we are um, already uh, past uh, um, half past four. I would like to um, take one more question on a different kind of uh, a topic that we haven't really addressed yet, uh, if that's okay with uh, with everybody. And, and that is the last question that was asked actually by an anonymous attendee. It's a question about ethics, um, uh, which we haven't really addressed yet. So um, the person asks, um, do, do you or did you face any issues um, uh, of uh, some of your interviewees or your sources experiencing secondhand trauma? Uh, how can researchers protect their mental and physical health and safety while working with perpetrators? And how can you protect that of uh, your sources? If I kind of semi raise a hand, but if another contributor wants to uh, take this one, that's fine too. Otherwise, well, let's go. Let's hear from Eva. 
It makes me recall what my uh, supervisor said a long time ago that I had to play pool a lot to get rid of all the, the terrible stories. It didn't work out, I can say. Um, yes, uh, I do think it, it, it affects you, it changes you. I do also think that trauma is also uh, part of a construct in how we should experience these uh, stories as well. Um, so I, I am always a little bit worried with the word of trauma because I think it, it, it comes with a whole package of how we understand these, how we should experience and understand the atrocities. Um, and in terms of protecting yourself, well, as an anthropologist, I think one of the first ways is writing it off. I think that Ivana might consider that too. I think that's a very important part. And reflexivity, also think about what is happening and yeah, turning your own experiences as part of the research, right? Why do I react in a certain way? And somehow that, at least to me, eases uh, the experience of anxiety as well. Uh, but there is not really a clear cut uh, method, I believe, how to deal with this. Yeah. Ivana, and, and then Andrea, that we haven't heard from much. So let, let's hear from Ivana first. Okay, thanks. Uh, I was thinking just how, how to protect the, the informants or the people whom we meet in the field. And there is a um, one thing that I've experienced, and I've seen it with the social psychologists as well, that, I mean, you can, in the first place, you, can, you can't force anybody to participate in your research. So that's, that's a one basic way of protecting them, only those who want to participate do that and that's true for everything I mean even for the general field work you always work with people who want to work with you and then you have to be reflective upon why just these people want to work with you and how are they a biased group because they always are they have their mo motives or they're I mean they're a type of people who want to work with an anthropologist a lot of people don't so you have to know that about your material in the first place uh, but yes, so they protect themselves and uh, generally even in the most traumatic experiences people won't tell you things that they are not prepared to tell you. If you don't, I don't know how, I've never been in a situation, but I guess you could, some people might want to push their informants in, in, in ethical, unethical ways, but I, I'm not really sure how you could push somebody into telling you trauma, traumatic things. Um, so, uh, I mean, if you're a sensitive person and socially competent, you probably won't be able to re-traumatize your informants. That, that's quite a good thing to know. Andrea. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. And I just want to mention one uh, possible uh, uh, important point to take into consideration and that is related to the fact that you know all the panelists actually traveled somewhere to do the research and I was doing research in my home country and uh, that's of course makes the situation very different uh, especially when uh, uh, you are uh, trying to uh, be a kind of norm entrepreneur and draw attention to certain values and issues which the majority of the society you are living in doesn't want to take into consideration. So it's, you know, it's easy in a sense to hire a local uh, research assistant and work with them. But and the question is what happens with the local research assistant when you are gone and your uh, research money is basically drying out? And is what is, uh, will that person be a, part of the, you know, changing the society or that person is uh, accommodating to the already existing uh, uh, framework and, and narrative and vocabulary. So, uh, and also I actually actively was seeking out for this topic. So, and uh, the, the people who I interviewed, they could have said no, but they did not say no because they wanted to influence the way how I'm writing about them. So um, uh, Erin has got a fantastic uh, uh, article about how actually the perpetrators are manipulating the researchers. So, so I think, you know, when we are uh, taking into, we are 
concerned about you know uh, the mental health of the researcher i would think about the mental health of the research assistants and also think about the um, uh, the, uh, the problem is the, the, the paradigm change in a sense, because it's easy to say that, of course, in Rwanda and in other countries, you know, the perpetrators and the whole silencing and whatever, but the heart of darkness is in Europe, right? So the heart of darkness is in Europe and all the discussions and the silences are actually coming from here. And I think my work and, you know, some other colleagues are actually pointing out that this uh, kind of extremely uh, 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 complex relationship to the dark legacy of uh, exclusionary practices, colonialism, uh, genocide, and the mass execution is actually, you know, coming from this uh, uh, this continent. So I would say that uh, I, I, it's it's important to think about our mental health, but of course it's important to think about our own responsibility and the whole context if we are able to do any kind of change and then my first contribution I actually point you know pointed out that what I feel my contribution is very limited thank you thank you any other uh, contributor wants to um, provide an answer or I think we're already uh, uh, way past um, half past four at least here in the UK it is half, half past four probably uh, another time where you are uh, so uh, I'd like to um, congratulate um, the editor and all the contributors again for uh, what, what seems to be a very um, impressive but also very diverse uh, uh, volume on researching perpetrators of genocide. So I think that's a testimony to, uh, as the discussion said, to um, uh, the vitality and the, the vibrancy of, um, of this field uh, of research at the moment. I'd like to thank, of course, also our discussant for engaging uh, uh, with the work of uh, all the scholars who presented uh, today and the audience for a set of uh, very dense and good questions, actually. I'm really sorry we don't have the time to engage with all of them. Uh, I can see that um, the speakers have actually also answered to some of the questions uh, uh, in the chat or, or in the q and I'm recopying again the link to the edited volume, which you can buy in every good bookstore, of course, and that you can ask your university to purchase uh, to help uh, the authors, of course. Um, you, I'm sure you can also find the uh, contact details for most of the contributors online. If you want to follow up with them by email, uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll reply to email. So once again, thank you uh, everybody for um, an engaging uh, conversation this afternoon. Uh, thank to PSN and to Tim for helping co-organizing uh, uh, this talk, uh, this event. And congratulations again to uh, all the authors. I hope uh, you enjoy the rest of your afternoon uh, and get some well-deserved rest. <laughs>